And so I'm delighted now that we have in our very own Zoom room um, an inspirational, incredible leader that has done so much. She is one of the 100 most influential Hispanics in the United States. I am just in, impressed with the amount of work that she has done in her history when it comes to affecting change here in the United States. She has litigated cases that have affected whether it was educational funding, disability rights, student disciplinary policies, or access to special services for English language learners, or even addressing issues that dealt with racially hostile environments. So I'm just pleased to have her here because not only is she gonna take us into a journey of her personal journey with regard to being a former teacher, a former assistant secretary for civil rights, a former member of the Biden-Harris transition team, and now the first Latina elected chair of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Help me welcome the first Latina elected chairwoman, Ms. Norma V. Cantu. Hello, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, so I missed yesterday, so I don't know if we thanked our uh, indigenous forebears. Uh, I didn't know um, growing up that that um, what my family belonged to. I think many of us would, would say that. Uh, but I, I did have a clue because my grandmother would, would call the uh, Thanksgiving turkey a guacolote, which is Nahuatl for pavo. Uh, and she would call the falda, the skirt that she would wear, uh, Nawa, which is Nawa Nawato. Okay, so I kind of had a clue, at least from one of my, one of my relatives. Um, my grandfather, on the other hand, the one who really looked Indio, did not know his tribe. He was orphaned very young uh, in South Texas. And uh, he, was, he was born before 1900 uh, near, near South Potter Island. So, hey, Shout out to those of you who have students who have uh, enjoyed Florida beaches and South Padre Island, be uh, Island beaches as well. My grandfather talked about the indigenous people of South Padre Island that, that he had heard stories about, and those were, those were the, the Tarahumara. And that I don't, I'm not sure what the tribe was famous for, but, but I asked, I'm reading in my Texas history book that there were some tribes that were cannibals. He said, not our tribe. And I said, why not? We only ate Spaniards. So I just want to share with you that he had a warped sense of humor, but his culture was one where he was inclusive of everyone. He wanted everyone to, to laugh at themselves and to laugh at a joke that has stint, uh, uh, standed the test of time. Um, I don't want to be as serious as I usually am because we have a lot of reasons to celebrate. Uh, and, so, and, 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 and I'm telling folks, I'm one of your reasons to celebrate, okay? I mean, I grew up in South Texas on a street that wasn't paved, uh, less than 12 blocks from the Rio Grande River. And, and the kids across the street would get on the truck to go pick harvest. And I looked at my mom and I said, I'm not getting on the truck. And she said, no, you're not. And she lied. Because, because one day she put us in the back of the station wagon and she took, to, took us to pick cotton because we had primos who were living near Corpos and they had to bring in the cotton that, that year and all the family had to come in and help. Okay, I am telling you that is the worst take your daughter to work day ever. So I would not do that to any member of my family, but we had bags and we had regular adult bags. And I said, mom, mom, you, you told us that when you were little that Apa made you a cotton bag that was child size. And she said, yes, he did. And, and, I, and then I thought, but wasn't that sad, mom, that you had a child-sized bag? And she said, no, because we filled it faster. So if, if you come from a family where everything is a joke, where everything can be turned into something that shows optimism that tomorrow is gonna be better than what yesterday was like, then you've got a head start. I mean, you've got, you've got strong families who, who, who the rest of the country doesn't acknowledge. Um, I, w I watched with, with very mixed feelings the family of George Floyd when, when they got the verdict, the guilty, guilty, guilty verdict. And, and my view on their talking about that, besides being emotional about it, was look at that family. Look at them praying every night. Look at them supporting each other. Look at them how compassionate and how, how 
attentive they were to the needs of, of their family member, George Floyd, and look at them not, not asking for vengeance, not asking for revenge. Look at that family, that's an American family. And those are the folk that, that uh, show an example for all people. I mean, that it, it, we don't divide about race when it comes to family. We should be talking about uh, the positives of the Latino family. And I'm gonna be talking about that because my clients were Latino families. So let me, let me shift the topic off, off of the, the things that are sad, to the things that, that, are, that, that, I mean, George Floyd makes me sad. So I apologize that I brought it up, but I can't, can't avoid talking about it. What I celebrate is um, I'm not first generation college. I'm one and a half because my mother and I were in college together during the civil rights movement in the 60s. My mother got this idea that I can do this and she finished her first year of college and then another year of college and then another year and did it very, very slowly. But you know, she had, she had six kids to raise at home. So she did it very, very slowly. But, but she saw me moving really fast through school. So she says, I better take more than one class a semester or Norma's gonna pass me. So we're in the same college yearbook together. I'm generation 1.5. And that makes, gives me a reason to celebrate that she convinced my aunts, her sisters to go back to college. And they, they were able to, to get really good jobs and were able to contribute to the families. That's a cause to celebrate. We have causes to celebrate that we, we have um, um, become visible in, in, the, in the area as our own distinct group, that we are not the other, uh, the other uh, color that's not white. Uh, so, so the big case that, 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 that came down uh, was Hernandez versus Texas. Uh, they, there was an, uh, an all white jury and Mr. Hernandez needed a, a, a to see a jury of his peers. And he was told, there's fights on the jury. They went back, there had never been a person with a Spanish surname. And they, as far as records went back and records went back like 60 or 70 years, zero. Zero people who were of Spanish descent have ever served on a jury. And, and so he went all the way to the Supreme Court and the state of Texas argued whites, you're white. So are, is, are we a race? or are we a culture? The, the, the US Supreme Court ruled, you are a discriminated against group. You're not even gonna, you're gonna dodge that question of whether you're a race. You are a group that has been discriminated against and the, and the discrimination covers uh, education, employment, housing, and all of the opportunities that, that whites get in your state. So the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court sent him back to a trial. You wanna know what's really cool about this, this lawsuit? There was a Latino uh, uh, filmmaker who decided to visit with both of the families. The family, Mr. Mr. Hernandez shot someone in a bar. So he talked to the shooter and he talked to the victim in the bar and, he, and their descendants, not the actual folk, but their descendants. And both of them talked about the lawsuit as something that made Latinos visible made Latinos or Hispanics, whatever we, we were calling them this decade, made them real because it gave them, they gave them the status of the Supreme Court saying, we know you, we see you, and we see what folk are doing to you. He was such a good filmmaker that when he had the premiere, he figured out how both families could show up at the premiere. Can you imagine your grandpa shot my grandpa? And he did a beautiful, beautiful uh, 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 orange, red, orange, a, a curtain, a velvet curtain between the, the aisles inside the theater. And he, and, and he, he did, at the end of the film, he, he let the curtain open and revealed to the families each other. And they've applauded together that the filmmaker had done a wonderful job of remembering who we were, remembering how their, both their families had suffered and celebrating the changes that those families had made. So we just need so much more of that type of ingenuity and that type of creativity of honoring what we have added, not to just our, to our, our communities, but to all the communities that fight for their rights and fight, fight for their protections. I, I celebrate that, that my high school doesn't look like it did when I was a high school teacher. 
When I was a high school teacher, I was 19 years old. They had no business hiring a 19 year old, but the teacher shortage was so horrible. They hired a 19 year old and put her in front of a classroom. And, it, and then they overcrowded the classroom with 30 plus students. Then they overcrowded the building and we had um, split shift. The seniors and juniors would go in the morning, leave at one o'clock in the afternoon. And that's when my classes would start at one. And I taught six classes in a row with no breaks. So, so teaching, teaching was something I loved, but it was kind of another take your daughter to work day kind of experience because it was tough. It, it, when it rained outside, sometimes it rained inside. The air conditioning couldn't keep up with a building that had been stuffed with twice as many kids as it needed to hold. And the reason for that I later learned was because we had inequitable state funding. And the reason for that I learned when I went to law school because there was a Supreme Court case that said the US Supreme Court doesn't care if you have inequitable state funding. Now there was a little tiny footnote that said, of course, if you get no school education at all, if you are completely excluded from public education, then we'll care, we'll look at that case. But that's not this case. The Rodriguez case was about comparable levels of funding. And the Supreme Court says, we wipe our hands, we wash our hands of that. It's not written in, in, the, in the Supreme Court doc, in the, uh, in the Constitution. There is no right in the Constitution to public education. Now think of all the rights that we have amended into the Constitution and we've never put education in there. Um, but the Rodriguez case is why I taught him in conditions that teachers shouldn't have to teach him with, with overcrowded and sometimes dangerous classrooms. I had an opportunity after law school to work for the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund. And I, was, and I loved it so much, I stayed there for 13 and a half years. The, the Maldive people um, had a backlog of cases for me and they were school desegregation cases. And this is, this is how the art goes around. Maldiv was filing school desegregation cases because there, there had been US Commission on Civil Rights hearings in Texas and a lot of Latino community groups decided, well, the African-Americans are winning these cases, so we're gonna file some more. Well, you filed some back in the 40s. I mean, Mendes and, and who, who, someone said San Felipe del Rio, because that was one of the ones filed back in the 40s. So we, we started earlier than the NAACP did in filing DSEG cases, but we caught up in, in the numbers because we had a backlog in Maldives, and so Maldives is sending out lawyers to desegregate. Um, what schools did we work on? We worked on, on uh, at first, the, the donuts. So I call the donuts those school districts that, that, that are big, and then in one part, there's a, a, a density, an over-concentration of just people of color. Or it's the other way around. It's a big school district, and then there's this one little density, this little island of white people. So those were the easy ones because it, it was easy to redraw maps and easy to, to, to convince the courts. One of my famous cases, guys, was Odessa, Hector County. Odessa is right next to Midland. You know where Midland is? Well, go to Dallas, Fort Worth, and keep going for about 10 hours, and you'll get to Midland. Um, Odessa was sued by the Department of Justice in 1970, along with seven other Texas uh, school districts and the Texas Education Agency. The others went into court, had trials, and nobody went back to Odessa. So Odessa had just like kind of disappeared and you know like hidden behind a sandstorm or something. And Odessa had, had not caught anybody's attention for a couple of decades. But I inherited Odessa and DOJ and I went back in again. And we found out you were twice as likely to have a, a teacher with more than two years experience if you lived on the white side of the railroad tracks. You were 10 times more likely to have a teacher with a master's degree or a doctoral degree if you were on the white side of the railroad tracks. The football team was the famous um, uh, Hector County Mojo, Permian High School. These folk went to state, state championships every year, had a budget that was huge. The, the buildings on, and I'm talking about a case brought in the 80s. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not talking like an old case. I'm talking like about a case where their defense for why they didn't put a school in a place that was mutually accessible by the Latinos and the non-Latinos 
was honey, every time we drill and build in that part of town, we hit oil. Okay, we all should have that problem. All school administrators should have the problem that you strike oil every time you go out and dig a hole in, in, uh, in, in the playground or in a property that the school owns. But the famous thing about that is we integrated the football team. And guess who learned about that? Well, some, some writer in New York City who wrote Friday Night Lights, who talked about an integrated high school team that was black and white and Latino. And that was the result of a Maldiv case where we were able to integrate the students, the communities, and the extracurriculars. That was the hardest. But another, another famous Maldiv case was, was Edgewood versus Kirby. Uh, that's our school finance case. Okay, so let me tell you why, why I, got, I got dragged into Edgewood. Our co-counsel, Al Kaufman, doesn't take no for an answer. So when the Supreme Court said no in the Rodriguez case, he said, there's gotta be another way. And he went and talked to uh, educational researchers, the same folk who train you all to be principals and train you to be superintendents. Well, they trained Al Kaufman how to sue the heck out of Texas. They trained him on what experts he needed and what, what data he needed to produce. And, and so Al convinced um, the rest of the organization, Maldiv, let's go sue Texas for, for inequitable school funding. So was it inequitable? Was it like a slight difference? It was a 20 to one difference for, for, for every nickel that a, a, a school that was predominantly uh, uh, low, pro low property wealth, a, that same nickel of tax would raise a dollar of tax uh, in, in, a, in, a, in an Anglo or an affluent neighborhood. So 20 to one difference meant, meant real, but we needed real evidence. We needed real proof that it mattered. That well, oh, by the way, every superintendent that was rich says money doesn't matter. You could teach under a tree. I mean, all the ancient Greek philosophers did that, but they wouldn't share any of their money. So we had to prove to them that money mattered. And, and here's some examples. That, these are examples that you all were raising that came up through the pandemic. Our classrooms um, uh, were not big enough that if there were an emergency, you could put more people in and space people around. Remember the example I gave you of an overcrowded classroom and having to teach on double shifts. So we had we had building capacity issues back then. And we showed that that was predominantly in the low property tax places. Our, our, our ability to prepare people for college was hampered, again, because we didn't have the, the science labs, we didn't have the specialties. But you know what? We taught computer science in Latino schools, computers. Okay, figure how that was, okay? That we had it on the books that we taught uh, computer, uh, computer science, but what the kids had was a piece of paper where a template was drawn on it to look like a keyboard. And they were asked, use your imagination. Imagine that you're pressing the run key or imagine that you're pressing the enter key. And then imagine that your screen now says, and then, then they would read you what the screen would say if you had a screen. This was back in the 80s and 40 years have gone by and we're still in a digital divide. We're still having a whole lot of concerns about our, our, all of our students, not just our Latino students, but all of our students having, having the support that they need, not just to use computers, but to actually be creative and, and to make things uh, with the computers. Um, and, then the, and then the last part of it is, Darn if there wasn't that same New Yorker running around looking for something to write about. And he wrote about, uh, he, he, he wrote, the, these, these people who work on the East Coast steal all our best book ideas. Uh, I tell folks, if you don't see a Latino book that tells you something that you're very interested in, write that book. Because otherwise someone in, in the East Coast is going to steal that idea and write, write it for you. Well, they wrote a book, book called Savage Inequalities. You know, Coso? Big, 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 uh, a bestseller, and it was all about the 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 Edgewood case that Lucky was won. It took more than a decade. It took six trips to the Texas Supreme Court. It took uh, a lot of school superintendents, a lot of school principals, and it took a lot of research data. One of the best testimonies that went in, and I think it's national. We have, we lose a lot of our best teachers because they leave the profession. They don't leave your school to go to another school. 
They don't leave your, your district to go to another district. They just leave teaching altogether. And we put on data for the judge that says there are three reasons that you're losing your best teachers. One, they, they got a job offer. Two, they're looking for a job offer. And three, they don't think their school administrator understands them. That they're not, they're not connecting with, with their school administrator. And you can imagine, think of someone teaching bilingual education who's working twice as hard as everyone else, who's preparing multiple differentiated lesson plans, and then is being visited you know, briefly by the principal and is being told, yeah, but you're not as popular as this other teacher, or you're not doing such and so, which is this other teacher does in her or his free time. So the not respecting and the not understanding and not being able to give people feedback and support was number three on the Texas list of why, why we were losing teachers. So with with a, a wealthy state with great wealth throughout, the Supreme Court kept ruling against the Texas Education Agency saying, fix the problem, fix the problem, fix the problem. Finally, the court dismissed it and said, this is as far as the courts can go. We can't think of any more reasons to say that you're unconstitutional. We think you're barely constitutional, but we're ready to let go of this case. And we thought it was gonna be the end of fighting for, for equitable school funding. You know what happened? Something so miraculous that makes me celebrate. A retired Supreme Court justice volunteered to chair a committee on a study on Texas public school finance. And he convinced both Republicans and Democrats together to say, just because you're released from the court doesn't mean you don't have any responsibility. And they put in a few more billion dollars into education based on his committee report. So I want you to think of that. I want you to think of the, the friends that you have out there that you didn't know were your friends. We have allies, we just haven't, it's like our tribes that we don't know the name of our tribe, we just don't know their names yet. And we will, we will know their names. Because okay. Plyler is the biggest reason to celebrate. The biggest reason to celebrate, celebrate is because this is one where the families um, uh, had nothing to lose. Remember I told you there was an exception that said, if you can't get into school at all, then, then maybe you could go back to the Supreme Court. Well, these were kids who could not go to school at all because they were being charged out of state tuition. And, and it was intentional. The state and the local district knew it, that they couldn't afford it, kept them out. Supreme Court ruled 5-4 that, that the, the, uh, the public education um, was, was being denied in a discriminatory manner. They didn't rule on the, on the issues of immigration and the state enforcing immigration law unfairly, that they didn't get there. They just went back to equal protection that these children wanted school. And you know what the evidence was? The children came forward, testified in court. They were afraid they were gonna get deported. They were afraid that the neighbors would come after them. I was there in Tyler when it was going on. There were swastikas painted everywhere, everywhere. So they had reasons they, 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 to be afraid. Um, but they won. And when they won, I got a phone call from the local council and the local council said, Norma, I wish you were in Tyler today and you could see what they've done to my office. And for a second, I was scared and I thought somebody vandalized. He says, all the parents who make their living as agricultural workers, and by the way, the agricultural product of Tyler, Texas is long stem Tyler roses. They had filled his law office with long stem Tyler roses to show their gratitude and to celebrate that families can win and families can get forward if they're involved and that families are their, their kids' own heroes. And so I want I wanted to, to give you homework. Can I give everybody homework? Because I used to teach you know, ninth grade. So your homework is reach out to some family folk that you know. And instead of saying, I'm gonna do this for you, I know how to write this letter, or I know how to make this presentation, or I know how to get this politician to do something, teach them how to, because they deserve to be their children's heroes. All right, we're gonna go ahead and start with the first one there. It says, Lagrimas de Amor, and we're so lucky for your journey and your continued fight, thank you. As a Caucasian, how can I be a better ally? That's a great one. Chairwoman Gandhu, what do you think? Let me unmute first. Thank you for that because the, the, 
I'm trying to be an ally of, of groups that I don't belong to, uh, particularly the, the transgender uh, community because the, the, the hate crimes and is, uh, are, so, are so severe. And, and now of the, of the Asian American community, because again, the hate crimes are so severe. You, you can be an, an ally by teaching yourself. Um, the, folk, the folk are, are, are so busy um, trying to, to, to conduct their fights that they can't, they can't, don't have the luxury I have of being able to teach about it. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm grateful to the University of Texas at Austin that it lets me work with my students on these issues of, of Latinos. But as an Anglo, you, you, you have to remember what uh, Dr. Arturo Madrid said. He said, Latinos are connected to everyone. You know, they, you, you're, they're connected to us in, in, in to every group and culture. They're connected to everyone in, in aspirations and hopes for this country. And he says, and in a few years, they're going to be connected to everyone because they're going to be your brother-in-law. So, so the, the, you, you, you are, by necessity, you're going, you're, you're, you are either now or soon will be connected to Latinos. So, so the, if, if you're looking for specific things, all of the Latino groups I'm aware of, LULAC, GI Forum, uh, SPIRA, I mean, Cuban American groups, uh, Puerto Rican groups, they are inclusive. They don't have a line that says you have to show a card that says you're Latino. They want allies. So that, that, that's one way to do it. Uh, and, and you have research talent or you wouldn't be in this audience. And Latinos are always needing that evidence-based research that, that, that you all know how to do. Uh, whether you're a quantitative person or a qualitative person, you can be of help. And, and we've won a lot of lawsuits because of our Anglo allies who have testified that, that uh, they tried to vote at the same time and they saw that Latinos got treated differently in, in, in trying to, to register and to vote or that the students um, uh, tried to get access um, to, to certain information and they couldn't get it because of the barriers and the obstacles that were placed there in their path. So you, you, you are our friends and our allies and I love you. Well, they're definitely very grateful to have you here with us today. Do you think the current administration will deliver immigration reform? Absolutely, absolutely. They, 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 the Latino community is very organized in, in communicating how urgent this is. The frustration in the past has been that, that people try to splinter off the dreamers and say, we'll take care of just them. And everyone else, we, we're not interested in them. We don't even want to discuss it. And they don't realize that we have people who, who have, who have um, been persecuted in their home countries, who have suffered uh, tremendously by, by internal um, strife in those countries. And, and um, to, ex to only, only address legislation to the dreamers is, is wrong. I mean, it, it, it's, um, I don't know why we haven't taken care of the dreamers plus taken care of their parents and plus taking care of people who are, who are here um, because of, of, of terrible conditions in their home countries. The, the other way the business community can be hugely, hugely helpful is, is to, to help, help the, the Congress and the White House describe a plan for addressing the needs, the economic needs in other countries. We're on a spending spree here in the US and, and somewhere in all that, all that budget that we've been approving, there could be a small amount that we could use to address some very urgent needs uh, in Central and South America and other countries. How would you suggest school leaders begin to increase a safe environment for a growing community yes. of students identifying as Latinx? Often school leaders and teachers alike have biases that impact student learning. How do you promote equity and inclusion among staff with biases? So, so there's an internal uh, self-examination that has to be very rigorous where school districts need to look at uh, what, what are the ba barriers and obstacles that, that their teachers and administrators have been posing. Um, if you don't ask, you'll never know. So there's kind of like a don't ask policy where they don't, they, they, they don't respond with um, uh, as close an examination of, of, uh, of complaints. Uh, in, in, in Texas, the, there, were, there were some school districts that didn't like bilingual ed, even though it was the state law. And so they, they kept um, file, uh, uh, telling, telling school districts, uh, the Texas Education Agency kept telling school districts, uh, when a complaint comes in, don't send it to us. You really should send it to the feds because they have more expertise. 
So they were avoiding changing the culture. So part of it is reporting things that, that are, are obviously a different standard or a different treatment of, of Latino families and Latino communities. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, our state of Texas loves standardized tests. Now they're less in love with it now than they were before, but they loved it. They stopped giving standardized tests to the Latino students because they were told by a federal court, you need to teach them in the language they understand and can perform better in. And the, 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 uh, the twisted lawyer logic of it was, well, the judge said, if you're gonna test them, you need to test them in the language. So we just won't test them, we'll just exempt them. So families that, 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 that were Latinos got no feedback, no, no loop of information the way Anglo English speaking families got. And that needed to have been reported a lot earlier and it needed to have been sued a lot earlier. Uh, so there are some different treatments out there that are happening that can, can get reported out. Let me tell you that, that the training of administrators is vastly better to spot those issues of unfair treatment. And, and we have, but we still have a long way to go to be more integrated as far as the top administrators. You know, we, we, um, we, we, we still have that as a challenge ahead of us. We certainly do, and we're out of time. And I'm saddened by that because this was an incredible uh, interactive discussion with you. And we're grateful that you took the time to come and be here with us. 